I'll just say right up front that this sermon is not original with me, uh, but after last week, I've been wanting to preach the sermon ever since I've heard it, and after our sermon last week, I felt like it was time, it was the perfect segue into this series. It's called In the Master's Hand. The story we're going to look at today is found in Luke 9, Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 6, all four Gospels. How many of you remember last week in the story of Blind Bartimaeus and the story of James and John, one of the things that we looked at, and we've been seeing this all throughout our studies in the last year or so, and this is an important key to the kingdom, I believe, very important, one of the most important, I would say. If you have no need, you can't have any help. If you have need, then Jesus can help you. If you don't, he can't. It's very simple. And so today we're going to look at, continue looking at that principle of Scripture. We're going to turn to Mark 6, if you're not already there. This is prior to sending out the 12, which is the story we're really going to delve into in the series. But I thought it important to read the background before he sends out the 12. Keep in mind what we've been talking about. Having no need equals having no help. Jesus can't help those who have no need of him. The reverse is true. Those who have great need can have great help. Mark 6, starting in verse 1, it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. That happens a lot today when you preach the truth, you preach the word. People take offense at the truth. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And this is what I want you to focus on. Verse 5, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Think of that. Son of God, we talked about this last week. Is there anything that God can't do? Well, verse 5, and he could do no mighty work there. And that's an incredible section of scripture. And it says, can you imagine Jesus marveling? And he marveled because of their unbelief. What did we see last week with Bartimaeus and all the people that Jesus healed? Jesus' healing in their lives was directly linked to what? Their faith. And it says, he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's a big difference than a whole multitude being healed. There's, a, there's an equation that this, this whole story is. And it's for Jesus to touch us, this is what the equation is. Need plus faith equals a master's touch. Need plus our faith equals a touch from God. And we've been seeing, in the, in, there's, a, there's another way of looking at scripture that I believe is very enlightening. You always do the reverse of that, the reverse of things. No need plus unbelief equals no touch. No mighty outpouring. And I believe it is imperative and important that in every area of our lives that we keep this in our minds and hearts because this is a principle and a law in God's kingdom. It's kind of like gravity. There's principles in nature. What goes up must come down. This is one of those things in the kingdom. If you have no need, you can receive, plus unbelief, you can receive no help. The reverse is true. You have need, you have faith, God can touch you. Let's turn to Luke 9. So that's the background setting. He could do no mighty work. Because of their unbelief, Luke 9, verse 1, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two t- tunics apiece. So we start here with the Messiah's mission. Mark chapter 6, verse 7 says he sent them out two by two. 
They're sent on a Messiah's mission. Jesus comes to his men and says, I'm going to send you out. It's kind of like the general coming to the privates or the sergeant coming to the privates. Men, you're going into the battlefield. And they were sent with two things. They were sent with power and they were sent with a purpose. Right off the bat, one of the things that we can glean from this section is that God's callings are also God's enablings. When God calls us to do something, he will always, always enable us with power, and he will always equip us with the tools to fulfill that calling. Notice where he says, it says in the Bible here in this passage, it says, power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. This is the power. Then it says, and to preach the kingdom of God. That's their purpose. His power and his, and his enablings is for his purposes, not ours. And so often, I would say in the body of Christ, we see the reverse of that, unfortunately. It seems like a lot of preachers, a lot of people in the body seem to have the, the other thought. God's power and his enabling is for their purpose, not for his. Let's continue. Mark 6, verse 8 and 9. This is how he outfitted them. He's going to send them on a, on a quite the mission. They're going to have power over all demons. They're going to have power to cure diseases and heal people. And this is what he gives them. It says, I like how it says this, he commanded them. He didn't ask them. He commanded them to take something. No, it says he commanded them to take nothing. Not even a little bit. Nothing for the journey except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He commanded them to take nothing. Think of those things it mentions. Bag, bread, money, clothes. Nothing for who? Themselves. Nothing carnal, nothing of the flesh, because what do we know the Bible says? It's not by might, nor by power, but what? By my spirit, says the Lord. The problem we have in the body, again, another major issue, is people are doing things with the arm of the flesh. And when Christ sends out his 12, what does he do? He says, you're not going to take anything. He says, take my power, take my gospel, take my spirit, take my presence, take my healing. But when it comes to the things of the flesh... Leave all of that behind. All of it. Because in the kingdom of God, which is another principle, less is always much, much more. In keeping with this thought, 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God has chosen the foolish things, the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the what? The weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. God loves to work his power through us, but much like the principle that he cannot help those who aren't in need, neither can he work through those of us who use the arm of the flesh and the methods of man. The arm of the flesh will always fail us. The power of God will always be victorious. Example, and I won't spend any length of time on this, but I want you to think of the story of Gideon. Gideon is a weak man, right? Hiding in the in the grain bins, so to speak. God comes to him and says, I'm going to use you to deliver the Israel from the oppression. He starts out, I don't remember the exact numbers, but does anybody ever remember the exact numbers that he started out with? It was thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, I believe it was, of men. And they're going to go up against this great army that, that were oppressing the people of Israel. And God whittles them down a little bit to a couple less thousand. And a little bit more, he whittles them down. And by the time he's done... He's got 300 people, 300 men willing to fight against a giant horde of enemy. Because why? God doesn't use the power of the flesh. He doesn't use the arm of the flesh. He uses the weak things to shame the wise. Because let's think about this for a moment. Had Gideon won with thousands and thousands and thousands of men, it would be very easy to say, look at what we accomplished. We're, our force was greater. We were more skilled. God says, no, 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 no. Just to show you my power, just to show you what I can do, I'm going to win the battle with just 300 men. I don't think that's coincidental. That's a principle in the kingdom. Less is always much, much more. Let's go on in Mark, skipping ahead to verse 12. Mark chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible doesn't expound on the tw what the 12 did very much, but I'm assuming since Jesus sent them out with power to cure diseases and cast out demons and preach the kingdom, 
they did it. I'm sure it was a mighty thing. We pick up in verse 12. It says, So they went out and preached that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Think of the excitement this must have brought the twelve. They'd been watching Jesus and his miracles, and all of a sudden he comes to them and says, Guess what, guys? I'm going to give you the power to do the same thing. And they go out and do that. Mark 6, going, we're going to skip way ahead now. Mark 6, verse 30, it says, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Luke 9 says it this way, And the apostles, when they returned, told him all that they had done. I believe these men were excited. They were thrilled to tell Jesus all the things they had done in his name and for his kingdom. And how could you blame them? It's kind of like they were sent on this mission. They were successful. They conquered the enemy. They built the kingdom of God. They preached the kingdom of God. They healed people. They cast out demons in his name. And now they're gathered. Jesus, you are not going to believe what we did in your name. Wait till you hear all the things that we accomplished in your name and through your power. I'd say that's pretty exciting. I'd be excited if I was them. You're, Lord, you're not even going to believe we walked up to a lame man who was begging for money. We said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Rise up and walk. And he got up. You're not going to believe it. This guy was on the side of the road. He was blind. We came. We, in your name, we healed him, and he opened his eyes. You're not going to believe it. This man was demon-possessed. And we cast out demons in your name. And, he, and, and, he's, and the man's a different, changed person today. He's, he's completely cleansed. It's exciting. He was exci they were excited. It almost reminds me kind of like the after party. This is the wonderful after party. And Jesus' response is in Mark, found in Mark 6, 30, starting in verse 31. It says, And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. I think Jesus was thrilled to hear about it, just like they were thrilled to tell him about it. And he says, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat, so they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. I believe the heart of Jesus was thrilled to hear about their exploits. How could he not? He sent these men out on a mission to build his kingdom. And what do we always thought? What have we been looking at? The reverse. Think of the reverse. If you're building God's kingdom, what does that mean? Satan's kingdom is getting torn down. That's exciting. That's thrilling. I believe Jesus was thrilled to hear about it. So he says, come aside. Let's go to a quiet place. Tell me all about it. In essence, he says, for they were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. I believe that rest is a necessary part of ministry. Growing up in a pastor's home, I could see it. My dad, he would get worn out. Yes, it's exciting to build the kingdom of God, but there's a time for rest. Even Jesus says, went to deserted places up high up on the mountain to have alone time. It wears you out when you're ministering to people. It was, it was a. It, a wonderful time for me when um, this past New Year's, when you guys were gone, I had a couple weeks off to rest. It was, it was rejuvenating. And I believe that's kind of where these disciples were at here. It says they didn't even have time to eat. They were excited. They were thrilled. They couldn't wait to tell Jesus, but these guys were tired. They're weary. And they're hungry. And I think that sounds like a lot of people on, after church on Sundays. They're hungry. They're checking their watches. Hey, man, I got a roast. This, this guy's kind of preaching a long time. They're hungry. They want to eat. Well, can you imagine these guys had been on this mission? The Bible doesn't say how long, but I'm sure it wasn't a day trip. Because the fact that Jesus says don't take anything for the trip, money, bread, all this stuff, I'm sure it wasn't just a one-day one deal. And so they're hungry. They're tired. It's time to bask in the afterglow of their mission and relax. Eat, be rejuvenated. It says, so they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. I think these guys were relieved to be going on a sabbatical. They were happy. They, they got to have one-on-one -on -one time with the Savior, finally. This all leads up to Mark 6, verse 33. This is where the story takes a, a turn for the worse, at least I'm sure to the disciples, in their eyes. 
Verse 33, it says, but the multitudes, the multitudes, not a couple people, not a one or two families, says the multitudes saw them departing. And many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. So much for rest and relaxation. We have here an interruption about to take place. The disciples are out of ministry mode. They've done their duty. They've done their mission. They haven't, they've done it so much so that they even ha haven't even had time to eat. And they just want to relax. They want to tell Jesus about their exploits, maybe catch a few fish, sit on the beach and grill some fish over an open flame, and have a good old time of rest and relaxation. But, but, the multitudes saw them departing and arrived before them and came to him. The disciples are about ready to have their dinner time. They made reservations at the beachside hotel, beachside restaurant. And they're ready to just hang out and enjoy a well-deserved, well-earned vacation. But the multitudes saw them departing and arrived before them and came to him. And it says in Mark 6.34, it says, And Jesus, it doesn't say, And the disciples of Jesus, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was, listen to this, moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd so he began to teach them many things Matthew 14 says it this way he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick verse 34 is an extremely enlightening verse that reveals the heart of God always because it says that he saw a great multitude. And when he saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion. And so he began to teach them many things and healed their sick. Jesus saw, he was moved, so he began. Saw a great multitude. He saw a congregation full of needy, desperate, sick, infirm people full of blind Bartimaeuses, full of women with issues of blood, people that were needy, demon-possessed people, people that had been under the thumb of the Pharisees and were dying on the vine, so to speak. He sees a giant multitude, and what was his response? You know, guys, I, I appreciate you coming out today. I really do. But we had reservations at this beachside restaurant, and maybe tomorrow, maybe even next week, you come on back and we'll... we'll We'll have church. I'm kind of, my guys are tired. They need a break. I need a break. I need to go to a deserted place and get along with my father. No, what's it say? He saw, he was moved, and he began. It was almost like all the plans that they had were non existent. And how many of you remember who was the one that said, let's go to a deserted place? It was Jesus. That was Jesus' idea. Yet now, when the people show up, his immediate response is to begin to touch them. He was moved with compassion for them. Jesus did not sit idly by. He didn't tell Peter to turn the boat around or pre pretend that he didn't notice the giant crowd that had assembled on the beach. So often, and I'm guilty of this, needy people come into our lives at an inopportune time. And it's kind of like, well... I'll, I'll help you maybe some other time when I have a little bit more of a better opportunity or maybe we just pretend like they're not even there. We, we kind of see them out of the corner of our peripheral vision and we turn around and start making a conversation with someone else who we deem is more worthy of our time. That wasn't Jesus. It says he was moved with compassion for them. It says <clears throat> he saw them. He saw them. He saw them as sheep not having a shepherd. How many of you know Jesus is in the shepherding business because the Bible calls him the great shepherd. And I believe the heart of the great shepherd is when he sees sheep that are scattered all over the mountainside, lost, not having a shepherd. What does he do? He says, come into my fold. Come into my flock. 
Even though Jesus' private time was interrupted, his peace and his tranquility was about to be majorly inconvenienced. His plans for a company picnic with his top men were about to be put on hold. The Bible says he was moved. He didn't sit on his hands. He didn't pretend that he didn't see him. He was moved. He was moved to action. Because at that point, I believe nothing else mattered to Jesus. None, none of his plans, none of the disciples' plans, none of their opinions, none of his desires, none of his wants mattered. The only thing that mattered was that there was people in need and he began to move. I believe it's still that way today. I believe the heart of the Father is moved with compassion towards those of us who are desperate and needy. Because our Father is in the healing and restoring business. People always came first for Jesus. There wasn't ever a time where Jesus was too busy, where there was too much going on. There was never a time when the format of society and, and, and the, the way that we like to say put, put priorities in order of importance was more important than the people that were in need. It didn't matter that maybe the scribes and the Pharisees were around him and he was exposing their hearts. It didn't matter that maybe there was really important people around that wanted to talk to him. But see, over here on the side, there was a bunch of little children that wanted to talk to him. And what was his response? What was the disciples' response is a better question. What was the disciples' response? Because most often, and I myself am guilty of this, our response is, you know what, hey, kids, go away. We're busy. Don't bother us. The adults are talking. And, of course, I do think there is a time and a place to say that and do that. I have to do that with my children quite often. But Jesus' heart was what? Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Don't forbid the little children to come to me. James, John, Peter, what's the matter with you guys? Don't forbid those little children to come to me because guess what? Unless you have the heart of a little child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't forbid the little children to come to me. Don't forbid the paralytic man who's being lowered through the roof to come to me. It doesn't matter that I'm in the middle of a great teaching. When this guy shows up, guess what? I see it, I am moved, and I'm going to begin to do stuff. He was moved with compassion. He was moved with mercy. He was moved with grace. He was moved with love. There was one thing Jesus did not do. He did not tell them to go away and come back later. He was moved now, in this moment. Not tomorrow, not a couple hours from now. He was moved now. His plans were put on hold indefinitely. It says, so he began to teach them many things and healed their sick. Luke 9 says it. He received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those, listen to how it says this, those who had need of healing. Because what's the principle we're learning? If you're needy, God can touch you. If you're not, he can't. He healed those who had need. Because I guarantee you this, there wasn't a single person that day who didn't need anything that got something. You understand what I just said? There wasn't a person there that day who didn't need Jesus that received the touch. But on the opposite, those who had need of healing were healed. When Jesus sees need, he is moved with compassion and he begins to reach and touch those who are seeking and needing and believing. That is always his heart. And I would say to us today is those who are being trying to be conformed to his image, that should always be our heart. When we see need, when we see desperate people, those who are in need of something more than they have, we need to be moved with compassion and reach out, touch those people. Because we've been given a, a great light. We need to shine that in the other hearts of other men. Mark 6, 44, it says, going on in the story, it says, we all know what happens, and we're going to look at this later on next week about how Jesus feeds the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fishes. It says, now those who had eaten the loaves were about, listen to this, 5,000 men. 5,000 men. Things getting ingrained in our, in our heads from the time we're little. I think this is one of those things. We always say, well, Jesus fed the 5,000. That's one of his great miracles. Well, right here it says he fed 5,000 men. What about the women? What about the children? 
I have a feeling it was a lot more than just 5,000 people sitting in the congregation that day. I would guesstimate between the women and children it could have been as much as 10 to 15,000. I think you could say that Jesus was the first mega church pastor. He wasn't in a little synagogue with a couple hundred people, maybe 50, maybe a small group like we have today. There's a whole bunch of people here, a whole bunch of people, all in desperate need. I think it's interesting. Jesus did not need props. He didn't need gimmicks. He didn't need an, an awesome praise band. He didn't need strobe lights. He didn't need a play or a skit. He didn't need the latest technology. He needed one thing. To begin to teach them the things of the kingdom and heal their diseases. Because when the power of God comes, none of that stuff matters. And I really truly believe, based on what I've seen over the years in the body of Christ, I think a lot of people would agree with this, the props, the gimmicks, the fancy stage lights and stage shows, those aren't touching people. It may convince them, it may convince them in their head, but is their hearts really being changed? I believe that when the Spirit of the Lord falls on the hearts of men, their lives will be changed. Think of Peter for a moment in the New Testament. It says that he preached... The gospel says he preaches the gospel of repentance, and it says, what is it? Was it 3,000 men? I think it was 3,000 men. It says, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? The Bible says it's through the foolishness of preaching that we're to save the lost. And what I really believe is happening today in the body of Christ, and I believe we need to be on guard against it ourselves, is that we're using the arm of the flesh, the methods of men, to try to reach people where they're at. It's much easier to take the armor of Saul. That's what's common to us. That's what's normal for us. That's what we're used to. We're used to the arm of the flesh. Because what? We're fleshly people. We're humans. It comes natural for us to grab the armor of men and put it on and go fight Goliath. But what does this man of the spirit do? What does David do? He puts on that armor and he says, this doesn't fit. I don't even know where to begin to use this stuff. Give me my sling. Give me my five stones. And I'm going to go slay this giant. And I believe that when the Spirit of God falls on us, in our communities, and our churches, the arm of the flesh isn't going to feel comfortable to us. It's not going to feel right. That armor isn't going to fit. The difference is, being a spiritual person, being a man of the Spirit, is a lot harder than grabbing the armor of the flesh. And being a man of the Spirit requires... A tremendous sacrifice in the sense that we have to press in. We have to run hard. We can't walk the race. We have to run the race. And that's not something we... I don't know. I've talked about this before. I don't personally enjoy running. I don't wake up in the morning and rub my hands and say, Oh boy, I can't wait to go for a good five-mile run. I don't mind walking to my car. I don't mind walking from my car to work and back again. But boy, going for a five-mile run doesn't really appeal to me. It's the same thing spiritually. We don't mind walking. We don't mind using the methods of the flesh, but you want to become a man of the spirit and use, let the presence of God come on you so strong that you begin to touch people's hearts with his power? That requires a bigger sacrifice. Think of the disciples. Think of the disciples. Those guys had to abandon everything. They had to quit their jobs. They had to leave their homes. They had to leave their families and travel around with this 30-year-old preacher who didn't have anything. He says, the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere. The foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. These guys had to leave it all. Is that easier? Or is it easier to be the rich young ruler that says, well, I appreciate what you're saying, but I really don't want to sell everything I have and follow you. Being a man of the Spirit is tough. It's hard. But it's through that that men's hearts are touched, not through everything else that we like to do, which is the arm of the flesh. Without the presence of God, without the power and the anointing of the Lord, we're a lot like the Pharisees. We're a lot like those whitewashed tombs, but we have dead men's bones inside. Our, our, our churches are filled with people that have nice sermons. They tickle our ears, they make us feel good, but when people leave, you meet them every day, they're no different than when they went in there. God help us. In the body today, there is a tremendous, I make no apologies for this, there is a tremendous lack of the moving of the Spirit. And is that His fault? Is it God just really isn't interested in moving upon us? No. 
It's our fault as Christians, as believers. We're responsible to remove the things of the flesh, to put down the armor of man, and to pick up the things of the Spirit. Because of that tremendous lack, we come up with anything and everything to fill in the gaps instead of recognizing our need and our lack, falling on our face and asking Jesus for a touch, humbling ourselves. We sang that song today, Lift Jesus Higher, because Jesus is the one who said, if I am lifted up, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to draw all men unto me. If we lift Jesus up in our lives, we become people, men and women of the Spirit, instead of the flesh, we lift him up, he's going to draw all men unto himself. There were three keys that Jesus had to reaching the needy. The first one, I would say, is something we would all find normal, maybe common, and say that we have, we have this in our lives. It was truth. Jesus spoke the truth. I'd say that most of us would agree that's a good thing. Truth is a good thing. And I would say that most of us would, would agree that we try to speak the truth. But it wasn't just the truth that Jesus spoke. He also had the right timing. It kind of reminds me so often, Christians, myself included, remind me of Peter. We take our swords out, our swords of truth, which is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with the sword of truth. It's a wonderful thing. But then we go hacking people's ears off with it. We don't drive it straight into their heart. The Bible says the, the, word, the, the word is a divider that divides between joint marrow, soul, and spirit. We like to hack people's ears off. We're good at that as Christians. But that's not what the sword of the Lord is for. I would say the sword of the Lord is more like a scalpel. It's a finely tuned precision instrument. Jesus not only spoke the truth, but he spoke it in the right time. And here's the third one. Extremely important. He spoke truth in the right time and with the right tone. Think of the New Testament examples, and we've looked at some of these in the past months. Pharisees. He spoke the truth to them. He spoke it in the right time and in the right tone. Growing up, my dad, my dad would say, well, that person just can't hear anything unless you hit him upside the head with a two-by-four. Those were the Pharisees. They needed to be hit with a two-by-four. Jesus went into the temple and started flipping tables over and driving out people with whips because it was the right time, and he used the right tone in that situation. But with the woman caught in adultery, he didn't start grabbing stones and hurling them. The man who was flipping over tables and driving people out with whips because it was the right time and that was the right tone, all of a sudden in this situation, what does he do? He says, you without sin, cast the first stone. The right time, the right tone. And he had truth. People love, I, I, I find it ironic how lukewarm Christians or even non-Christians love to use that story. Oh, you can't judge. Jesus said, you know, he was without sin, cast the first stone. That's one of a very popular statement, even among the ungodly. But what is the end of that story? It says, go and sin no more. That was the truth, but it was at the right time and the right tone. I'm sure that woman had no problem receiving that after Jesus had just spared her life. The woman at the well. Jesus told her the truth. You have five husbands and the, woman, the man you're with is not your husband. That was the truth. But it was the right time. That woman was ready. And it was the right tone. So much so that the Bible says she goes back into her city and her town and says, you are not going to believe this man who told me all the things about my life. And all these people flock to Jesus. Nicodemus. He's searching for something more. It's the right time. Jesus spoke to them the truth. He spoke to them in the right tone. However, whenever, and whatever Jesus said, it didn't keep rugged men from coming to him. It didn't keep needy women from coming to him. It didn't keep little children from coming to him. It didn't keep doctors. It didn't keep lawyers. It didn't keep hated tax collectors. It didn't keep prostitutes. It didn't keep rich people. It didn't keep poor people. It didn't even keep the Pharisees from coming to him. Jesus spoke the truth in the right time and with the right tone. And because of that, there wasn't a person in Israel that could resist coming to him. Whether you loved him, whether you hated, hated him, whether you didn't understand him, 
one thing was for certain. You could not resist listening to this 30-year-old preacher. Because he spoke the truth with the right time and with the right tone. And most of all, he met people where they were at. Going on in the story, Luke chapter 9, verse 12, it says, When the day began to wear away, when the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, this is where the story is, gets down to brass tacks, where it meets where we're at so often. It says, When the day began to wear away, the twelve came to him and said to him, Send the multitude away. Lord, we've, we went above and beyond today. You sent us out on a mission with nothing for ourselves, and we were fine with that. We did that. We went out. We preached your kingdom. We healed the sick. We did all these money works in your name. We, we, want, we, we were excited to tell you about it. We were interrupted, even though we had plans, dinner reservations. We got majorly interrupted. And, and we were okay with that, but now the day has begun to wear away, and, and it's, time, it's time for these people to go home. Send them away. Isn't that often how we are? It's easy to get down on James and John for asking him, him to sit at the right and on the left. It's easy for us to get down on them for, for saying, man, I can't believe these guys would say send the multitude away. But think of our own lives. How often do we do that? Lord, I poured out to people, but now I'm tired. I need, I, I need a little bit of me time. I need a little bit of downtime for me. I need to be restored. And I do think, let me just say, I do think there is a time and a place for that. But what do we say? The truth, the tone, and what else? The timing. This was not that time. To be honest with you, I, I have a little sympathy for the disciples here. These guys didn't even have time to eat. They're hungry. They're tired too. They need a touch too. And it's like, Lord, we, we've done our duty. We've done our due diligence. Send these guys away. They need to eat. We definitely need to eat. Send them away. But there was a problem here. Needy, desperate, and sick people, I would say usually, but I would say probably almost always, show up at the most inconvenient and awkward times. Desperate people are always an interruption to our lives. And the 12 had finally agreed. It doesn't say that Peter came, you know, Lord, I'm the spokesman. I, Maybe none of these other guys are going to say it, but because I'm Peter, I'm going to say it. It's time for these people to go. We're hungry. No, no, no. It says the 12 came. That's Luke 9, verse 12. The 12 came. I can almost picture these guys. Guys, let's have a, let's have a quick meeting here. Jesus is off teaching and preaching and healing people. Let's have a quick meeting. I'm hungry. James, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Peter, <laughs> you better believe it. All right. We're all in agreement. Let's go to Jesus and just say, Master, it's, it's time. Send these guys away because they, they, they've, we don't mind being interrupted a little bit, but it, it, this has gotten a little bit out of hand. All 12, instead of recognizing that these people were hungry, these people were hungry and they were standing in the presence of who? The bread of life. These people were desperately thirsty and they were standing before the living water. There were blind men in the crowd who had heard about an eye doctor who never gave out prescription glasses. This doctor was the kind of doctor whose only prescription he ever gave out was healing. People in that crowd who were in darkness began to see a pretty bright light for the first time in their lives. Those who were dirty, like the woman caught in adultery with the stain of sin, well, they had heard of this guy, and they, were, they had heard that he forgave sins. And that's what they needed. But the disciples, they wanted to send these people away because they'd been an interruption long enough. This is the problem. Jesus was saying, come. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the disciples were saying, go. Anytime, anytime we send people away from Jesus, this is a problem. We talked about truth, timing, and tone. How many of you know that the truth of what they said was true? The truth of what they said was right. Those were the facts. They were hungry. The people were hungry. It seemed like a pretty opportune time to disperse the crowd and call church a day. 
game called on account of rain. The problem was their timing was wrong, and so was their tone, because they were sending people away when Jesus was saying, come. How many of you know that actually in the same exact chapter that this story takes place, in Luke, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and consume a bunch of people. They were in a Samaritan place, and they were rejected. And they said, Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven and just consume these people like Elijah? Can you imagine that? But think of ourselves and our lives. Have we ever had that attitude? Enough with these people. They have rejected the truth. Let's call down some fire. What was Jesus' reaction? He says, fellas, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives. I've come to save them. Jesus never comes to destroy men's lives. He comes to save them. How many of you know the scripture says the Lord does not delight? There's no joy in the death of the wicked. Because he didn't come to destroy people's lives. He came to save them. And he always has truth, but it's always at the right time. And it's always in the right tone. In conclusion tonight, today, as we wrap up this first part of the story, so often our reaction is the same as the twelve. We want to send the people away. We're tired. We've done our due diligence. We've accomplished maybe in our minds the goals that he set out for us. And it's time for the people to go. But may the Lord, I would encourage us today, may we allow the Lord to teach us to speak the truth, always. But in the right time and in the right tone. May we lift up Jesus in our lives because he said that if he is, if he's lifted up, he's going to draw all men to him. So often we focus on our need. The disciples were hungry. They were needy too. They needed to have some time with Jesus. But their timing was off because so did that crowd of 10 or 15,000 men, women, and children. Bringing that home to our lives we all here recognize our need. We looked at that last week, but guess what? Our community is needy. Where I work, people I work with, they're needy. Our families, in many situations, are needy. People all over this world, not just in Shelby, Montana, but everywhere, people need the Lord. And the only way that they're going to see Him is if we, as his believers, lift him up. I encourage us that our hearts would be moved with compassion for the people who need the Lord. Think of how badly you need him and apply that to those around you. May we put aside all obstacles, all inconveniences, all inopportunity, all inopportune times. And instead of telling Jesus, Lord, let's send them away, May the Lord give us grace to turn them, regardless of how it inconveniences us, towards Jesus. And I end with this. May Jesus be lifted up in our lives, because if he is, he promised that he will draw them. And as we looked at, the people came. Amen. Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us to turn our eyes upon you. Lord, we truly do need you. We're desperate, needy people in so many areas, physically, emotionally, spiritually. But Lord, so is everybody else around us. Lord, they need to turn their eyes upon you as well. And Lord, you said that if you are lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. Lord, we realize as we've looked at today that we need to speak the truth unflinchingly, unwaveringly, but Lord, we also need to speak it in the right time. Lord, teach us your timing. Cause us to be men and women of the Spirit that we are moved by your Spirit at the right time. But Lord, not only the truth with, at the right time, but Lord, soften our lips, Lord, that we would speak your truth in the right time, but also with the right tone. That, Lord, when your timing, as it so often does, is inopportune for us, 
that when we are inconvenienced by the people who are in need, that, Lord, we will not be like the disciples and say, Lord, send them away, but, Lord, that we would be conformed to your image, Lord, and that we would have your heart where it says that you saw, that you were moved, and that you began. Father, teach us your ways. Lord, we need a touch. Lord, we need to be different than we are. And Lord, we want to be like you and we want to touch the needy people. We want to lift up Jesus in this community, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. Jesus, be Jesus in us, we pray this morning, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in our lives and through our lives that you would go with us throughout this week, that you would give us the grace to do the things that we have looked at, you would teach us to be men and women of your spirit and not of the flesh. We pray all this, Lord, in your name.